<laughs> Welcome everyone to our virtual reception. Um, we are celebrating the works of Tyler Autora Bushnell and Anna Matai. Um, before we begin, I would like to state that Artspan is committed to creating a thriving arts community where staff, members, and volunteers come together to exchange information and ideas with respect with each other. Acts of hostility and or aggression against any member of our community on the basis of race, ethnicity, age, disability, sexual orientation, gender identity, citizenship or immigration <laughs> status, socioeconomic status or religion will not be tolerated. Due to the unfortunate possibility of cyber attacks, we will immediately end this meeting to protect our staff, speakers and audience should an unwanted intruder impact this event. We apologize in advance and we hope this does not become necessary. On that note, we I'm now going to introduce our, our In Neighborhoods program for those who aren't familiar. It was initiated in 2018 with the intention of facilitating spontaneous artful discoveries by locals and tourists alike. These venues are not your typical white walled galleries or museums, but places we tend to frequent as busy urbanites, including cafes, restaurants, activity sites, hotels, and community centers. With the goal of bolstering our artist community with exposure and potential art sales, this program also intends to bring an influx of business to the participating venues. As when you are aligned with Artspan, you are aligned with our community-driven mission to keep arts alive in San Francisco. I would like to remind our viewers that SF Open Studios is happening now. Our biggest production of the year possesses hundreds of artists hosted events all over the Bay Area now through October 17th. Enjoy the vibrant and exciting creative atmosphere through engaging studio visits, evening happy hours, sidewalk pop-ups, and virtual happenings. Browse our SFOS event map to plan your art exploration and see art where you are. The SFOS showcase exhibition will be up from October 22nd to November 21st at Somart's Cultural Center. Please check the chat for the appropriate links now. Okay, and we're gonna move on. As I said before, we are gathered to celebrate the Tyler and Anna's art, which is on view at Kumaika Coffee until October 28th. This neighborhood cafe is cozy and, it, and it's a great place to enjoy a fresh cup of coffee and some snacks. Stop by to view the works in person and enjoy the unique energy the Southern neighborhood has to offer. To view works from the comfort of your home, please visit our dedicated online gallery. All right, and we're gonna to move to our first artist. Hi, Tyler, welcome. Hello, thank you. Uh, it's good to have you here. Um, I would say good Tyler here. has a mild obsession with circles. <laughs> And he uses this simple form to create intricate compositions that also embrace negative space. So Tyler, do you usually have a final image in mind before embarking on a new piece? Or do you <laughs> usually go off your intuition? Um, excellent question. So uh, no, not, I, I have no idea how they're gonna end up. So usually my, my pieces are very process driven and they sort of emerge over time. And so, uh, Basically, I, I, I try to set a set of rules as I embark on a piece. And I usually try to borrow these rules from the natural world. So like the way gravity pulls matter to the larger mass or the way wind flows around a boulder or like compresses um, or sometimes non-tangible things like the way people organize in society um, around you know ideas or, or other people. And so I, I kind of follow these rules and see where they go. And um, as I'm going, I'll often kind of step back and look at, okay, where is this piece going? How does it look? Like, is it, is it finished? And thinking about, you know, the previous circle and the composition and the balance. And if it doesn't feel done yet, then I'll keep going. Um, and I kind of don't know where it's going to go until, until I step back and it actually looks done. And um, yeah, every, every time I kind of look at it, I always find that there's there's a really interesting sort of part of that process, which is that every single circle is sort of uh, a, 
it's both a, a finished piece and a, an in-process piece. And it's something that I really tried to capture like in my Instagram um, with, with time-lapse photo or, or time-lapse videos. But um, it, it's sort of a reminder to me that kind of everything in the world is, also, is both a whole complete thing and also in process. And so okay. um, when eventually I do finish the piece, then it's kind of that point where I've looked at it and it feels like it, it captures something that, that I'm trying to capture with whatever those, those process rules I kind of set out with um, are trying to say. Excellent. Um, this one speaks to me. I love the texture of the, it looks geographical um, in a way um, and it's, it's quite beautiful. Um, do, you. You, do you find your practice um, meditative? Uh, yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, it takes a long time, as you can imagine, it's very mm -hmm. detailed work. Um, I really have to kind of get into the zone um, and kind of shut everything out and really focus on uh, channeling those, kind of channeling those rules that I've set up. So, you know, really thinking about what what do they mean? What does that mean for the next circle? How do I react to what's been put down on the page? How do I react to the the overall canvas and, and where I'm going? Um, and I really try to try to focus on that. And I also have to kind of like stay focused just as a way of getting around like the pain in my hand. Uh, after a while, you definitely start to cramp up. But mm -hmm. uh, I think I think staying staying in that meditative state def state definitely helps me uh, finish a piece. I definitely can relate. I like to do okay. intricate. Uh, ink drawings as well. And I understand the, the wrist and the hand pain. I, it's very familiar. <laughs> yeah. um, I noticed that you usually do work uh, on with ink and paper. Um, why did you choose to do something uh, acrylic on canvas like this piece? Yeah, um, so this is, uh, this is the first the first piece that I've done in, in paint, uh, avant garde, sunshine, spectacular, and it's on display now, um, which is sort of exciting. It's, it's definitely an experiment. Um, I wanted I wanted to try paint because of the differences in materiality and kind of the the, the strength of that of that material. The way it's it's really vibrant, it's really exciting. Uh, it, it carries a lot of energy with it. Um, and I've, I've been curious about it for a while and I actually discovered that you can get uh, paint pens, which was uh, a big part of, of me exploring this, uh, this medium. Mm -hmm. And yeah, I think, I think it's, a, it's a huge departure from the previous um, ink on paper, um, much, which is much more detailed and, and mm -hmm. you know, minimal and, and uh, specific. Um, and so I, I, yeah, I guess I'll see where it, where it goes. Um, I'm not I'm not sure how many pieces or if this is the new direction. Uh, it's still it's still very early in this exploration. Well, excellent. I'm glad we can um, give you the space to show something new, um, and we're excited to see how you progress in this new medium. Um, but moving forward, um, is there anything in particular that you think about when you work? Um, anything in. I try to think back to the those process rules, and really, that's that's where where my focus is. Um, it's it's a lot of action reaction, um, putting a circle down on the page, and then knowing where or, or feeling where that next circle is going to go, and and what the size of it is going to be, and um, is it going to you know are we am I going to switch colors and uh, of, of ink or um, is it going to be a new a new body on the page? Like a, a lot of that is very immersive uh, for me in in how I'm I'm sort of developing these pieces. Excellent. Um, do you uh, do you play music or do you listen to like podcasts or do you watch TV? Is there something you consume in addition to working? Um. If anything, it's it's music. Um, I, I would say it's either silence or music. <laughs> and if it is music, it's usually something uh, without lyrics, something that is, you know, uh, kind of like soft beats or um, 
you know, kind of like background or elevator music kind of thing that that can can help me like get in the zone and and let time kind of wash over me. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Okay, but uh, before we wrap up with Tyler, uh, do we have any questions in the chat? Yeah, we actually have a couple. One of them may have been answered, so I'm going to leave with the second. Um, Jason asked, um, he says, I'm curious, Tyler, how did you start and when did you know that you are an artist? Okay, um, excellent question. Uh, so the circles, the, this, this sort of like abstract method of, of creating circles, I would say I started, um, I, I found kind of the earliest, one of the, the earliest examples of me creating a, a, like a circleism sort of piece was I think 2011. Um, and it was sort of a, a doodle on the side of a coffee cup. Um, and it kind of kept showing up for me um, over and over again over the years uh, in, in different sort of mediums that I was exploring, whether it be pottery or um, uh, again, like sketches or, or um, different different paintings where um, I, I've tried to I've tried to really explore a lot of different things. And in 2018, um, I had this New Year's resolution where I was going to make a piece of art for every day. So at the end of the year, make 365 pieces of art. And every month it was going to be a different piece of art uh, or a different theme of, or a different medium or a different um, sort of aim. And one of the months I explored, I really dug in and I made this um, circleism scroll um, where I had a continuous scroll and I, and I drew about nine feet of circles on this, uh, you know, one foot by nine foot scroll. And I really, at, at the end of the year, that was one of my favorite things that I'd done all year. And so kind of following that, so this is, you know, just a couple of years ago, um, I decided that I kind of wanted to lean into to this more and, and explore where it, can, where it was going. Awesome. I love that. That is so cool. Any more questions? There was one more question, um, question and concern about your hand. I'm just curious <laughs> about how you maintain and protect and balance your hand while working on the detailed circles. I know you kind of touched upon it, but is there anything else that you can add just about the intricacy of that and the nuances of keeping your tools safe? <laughs> yeah, and unfortunately I've got no recommendations and I would be open to any advice. Um, I, I, protect, I protect the pieces with a, a tiny, you know, firm piece of plastic to make sure I'm not smudging, but I, there's, Besides just kind of adjusting the pen whenever it gets really uncomfortable, it's uh, I'm still trying to figure that one out. Mm -hmm. I'm assuming that it's just a you know a, a strength thing that over someday I'll be able to go for hours and hours, but I'm definitely not there yet. Nice. Well, I hope that you have a solution, find a solution one day, or find a great doctor that works out your wrist muscles. <laughs> This is last chance to ask Tyler a question. Okay, awesome. Thank you, Tyler, so much. Thank you. It's been a pleasure getting to know your process. Yeah. And we're gonna move on to Anna Matai. Hi, Anna. Hi. Welcome, how are you doing? I am good, thank you. Excellent. Um, Anna is a mixed media artist that uses abstraction, rich colors, and mellow monotones to express her experiences. So Anna, can you tell me how did you get involved with um, using architecture elements like plaster and what was the learning process like? Well, I actually started using the plaster because I've been doing a mostly DIY renovation of my apartment here. Recording in, in progress. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And there's, there's a circle area with this arch ceiling. I think you can see one behind me here, but there's a similar in front of me that is not a window. And I, it reminded me so much of a Greek fresca or something. And I thought I have to put something up there. And um, I had a friend who works in interior design and they do a lot of stuff with different plaster work. Um, and they suggested that, you know, maybe I try some Venetian plaster up there. So I thought that sounded cool. I saw it be burnished to this kind of brilliant shine. I thought it would be a great kind of custom thing up there. So I, I had this plaster bucket sitting in my apartment. Um, 
And before that, I had already kind of been dabbling in the idea of using clay and molding clay onto canvas to help try and build the 3D structural elements, especially on some of my larger pieces. And I, I figured this plaster, um, you know, it would hold texture better than paint and, I, and, you know, how it can be smooth to a shine and that I decided to try it. And even just within the first um, couple of pieces that I worked on, Trinity being one of them, which is a uh, which is on display at Kumaika, um, something just clicked and I knew I had found this material that to me it was everything that I had wanted in paint and more. Um, there definitely was a process of trial and error with trying to get the pigments right with the plaster where they were consistent and stuff. But mm -hmm. um, the texture really of it has been inspiring on its own and it, it's led to pieces like uh, Tyler and the Hermit and Salute, which really are, they're monochromatic canvases or basically monochromatic canvases that really just focus and highlight those textural elements. And um, while I started with the Venetian plaster up there, I've kind of, because of that moved and started exploring more um, with rough cast plaster that adds a different kind of texture in and then looking into spreadable cements as well, all to sort of just build these 3D highly textured canvases that interact with the light. Um, and, you know, it's I've started to work on like prototyping small home goods and furniture objects too, just with, decorative plaster elements, um, I just find this material like, super inspiring in itself. So there's definitely more to come there. Awesome. Yeah, I was definitely taken with your um, highly textured works. They, you know, like going back to Tyler here, um, it, it resembles frosting um, and, but also it's, it's, there's a roughness and it's intricate in its own way, but I know it was, I'm sure it was like really just fun to smear on onto the surface and get that surface activated. Yeah, I mean, what's interesting when working the plaster is that you do have to kind of layer it on. It takes a bit of patience, right? But you have to put a thin layer on and wait, thin layer on and wait. And then when I started working with a rough cast plaster, it was like kind of that was off the table and it was so fun because that's actually what you see in the middle of Tyler, like that center part is rough cast plaster. And so you can actually put it on a little bit thicker without waiting like the Venetian, the Venetian will crackle. Um, so it was really fun. Like that was actually one of the first pieces I did once I got the rough cast plaster and it was great. Great, awesome, I love that. Um, well, I'm gonna ask a question about Litscape um, amongst your, many of your pieces. Um, and if, is there any significance behind the, the 3D elements that you incorporate like foil, wire, or even um, micro suede, which we'll see down the road? Um, and what led to the inclusion of these elements? Well, like as far as the like, mixed media elements in my pieces, I've kind of always, I've sort of just used what I can get my hands on, what I have lying around. Um, I tried to use found objects or recycled objects. And one of my pieces, I incorporated an old thermostat that I switched out as part of my renovation um, and stuff like that. So the, the materials in themselves, don't have an innate meaning, but then I try and add them to a piece so that they have dimension and also just kind of convey, I guess, the emotional side of the picture that I'm trying to depict. Because um, I, I really do try and look a little bit at like how we viscerally respond to certain shapes or forms or colors and the psychology behind that. And like, that is a way to translate emotion in art. And I, I, I think that's something that I try to explore in a lot of my pieces. Awesome. Um, it's definitely a contrast to Tyler's work where he is completely 2D, very clean uh, ink on paper or paint on canvas. And you, here you are, come in with Foxy Lady. You have five inches of width, uh, or sorry, with, of depth of this piece. Uh, and you have the other works that have a little more, you know, that texture and that it, it come, they come out and they come alive. Um, it's really great to have you two paired uh, with each other just to give that kind of contrast and like what art is and it, 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 it's a great expanse. Definitely, yeah. Um, another question for you is that, do you have any notable experiences that you draw inspiration from? Sure, I mean, I, I, I really do try and keep my eyes open to 
to inspiration in anywhere in my life, even it's very like simple, boring things um, and just my observations of the world. But that being said, there are certain images and then themes that really recur, like images from nature or the female figure. And then maybe on a more deeper level, themes that um, stem from my experience as a woman um, or even more specifically as a brown woman um, and how that's been going through different stages of my life. Um, I am an immigrant to the U.S., but I grew up mostly in rural Louisiana. Um, apart from my family, I was basically the only Indian girl that you were going to see around town. And um, sometimes you're really privy to backwards thinking about race and gender. Um, and, and that definitely, you know, like I definitely learned from that experience how to like talk across bridges. Um, and, I'm, you know, I ended up spending some years in professional school, like with medicine and law. Um, and these big corporate environments. And all of these are really male dominated spheres. And so when um, you dig into the meaning, a lot of my pieces, um, there's a lot that really reflect on this experience of the other and what it means to navigate that territory. Um, so just looking at the tension between um, our needs for individuality and society and the expectations that society puts on us, um, which I think as a woman are often, we're at the end of a, a double-edged sword there. Um, so it's just really interesting to think of that balance. Um, and it's also really highly relevant to this year with COVID when we're having so many conversations about the individual and like what it means to be a neighbor and what it means to be a part of the community and how much care we take. and. Um, it's also, like I mentioned, the visceral emotional elephant, uh, um, elements of these pieces. That's also part of this the exploration of the other and the individual. It's um, how does our objective reality collide or conflict with our emotional or subjective reality or experience? And how do you reconcile those two? Like, how do you um, show the visceral emotion behind an experience or what's hidden behind just what's objectively there, um, bringing together the outer self and inner self into a piece of art. Wow, thank you. That your perspective is definitely needed and it's, I'm glad you are so um, eloquent and, and really bringing that down home and you, I really appreciate your take on that. Um, do we have any questions for Anna? Yes, uh, someone asked, uh... Do you know what you're going towards when you start or do you just go and see what happens? It's a bit of a mix. I usually start out with some general idea, um, but as I found like, uh, you know, it, it always builds upon there and that kind of creates the story of the piece. So I might have an idea of a form or image or that I'm starting out with, but it nearly never ends up what I expect it. I don't plan out every element of the piece. I don't plan out every color and I kind of try and go with the flow. And until I, until I get it to a point where I think like, hey, this looks complete. And sometimes it really takes leaving it. Um, I just finished a piece that I left for three months. Sometimes I really have to walk away because I don't know what the next step is, but I just know it's not ready yet. Um, yeah, I think for me, I know that time is a part of my work. You know, you need to let it settle in, you need to let it marinate um, and look at it from a distance for a long time. And then you start to notice like, oh, that's what it needs. Yeah. Like you can see after a while. So yeah, definitely resonate with that. Um, any, uh, any additional questions for Anna? Um, yes. And then we have another one that says, Anna, you seem like you're both left and right brained from your background. Do you agree? Yeah, definitely. And I think that there was like, um, it, it was interesting because that was always a confusing part to me when I was growing up because you have this conception, like, what am I going to be? And nothing that was set in these, set, these defined paths really seemed to make sense or cover all the bases. And I think as I've gotten older, I realized that like, I don't need like this idea of committing myself to one thing only is kind of ridiculous considering my personality. I've always been someone who's going to do a bunch of different things. And I'm sitting here, I'm installing a sink for no reason. I should really get a handyman to do it, but I'm doing it, you know, like I'm just this kind of person that I'm going to try and get my hands in everything. Um, so trying to really focus on just one lane of 
thinking doesn't make sense. And I think um, I, I really, especially like working in these like big corporate law firms, I just wasn't happy. I felt like I wasn't creating and that's something that's always been such um, an integral part. Um, and some, it used to be something I did in my spare time. I came to this point, I didn't have spare time and I really made a committed decision that I was going to move away from that. And it's kind of, I, I had heard people before say like, you start doing this because you have no other choice. You can't help it. And I, like when I was working 24 seven, I felt like, well, I can help it because I'm tired. And as soon as that pressure came off, it was like, this is what I'm doing in my free time because this is what I love to do. Like, I, I do have no choice but to do this because now I, I, I actually have the energy and like emotional capacity to, to devote that time to it. Awesome, yes, I love it. I think creation is number one. Yeah. <laughs> and it's you gotta do what makes you feel happy on the inside so I'm glad you're really pursuing that and listening to your soul because that's that's your that's your your gut feeling for sure so yeah Vanessa any additional questions I have one question I'm curious about the sizes of your works um I'm wondering if you know do you normally work on a smaller scale like these are like about this and I'm wondering like what the choices are in doing that and your use of space and kind of the thought process behind that yeah i'm not really committed to doing smaller works and i do have so i have one like three foot piece right here but um more the size limitations are more uh related to my working space right now because i'm basically working out of this one room that i'm sitting in so um i haven't been working on very large pieces i hope over the next year that i'll you know like figure start working on some larger ones and I have some larger two foot canvases sitting in the corner there. Um, so, so I'm kind of accepting a level of clutter here in order to guide, to bring you guys some bigger stuff too. Great. Well, we have a, oops, sorry. No, go ahead. <laughs> I was just going to say, if you have a preference either way, um, just whether or not you, you lean more towards another, not necessarily in terms of what, of your output, but your enjoyment or what you feel like fuels your fire is a, or is like easier to come out for you? I think it depends. When I was first just experimenting with different styles, it definitely made sense to work smaller. Um, and, and now I kind of think that it's nice to have a bigger area to experiment on. I'm mean, like, I kind of think of every piece almost like an experiment, like what's gonna happen. Like I say, like I have a basic idea, but I don't control what happens afterwards. And I try and go with the flow and accept you know, mistakes or errors as part of the process. And, and sometimes those end up being the best elements of a piece is when it's something that I just didn't intend and didn't plan. And, you know, um, so I, I think that that's why I, I really do try and mix it up a bit, but I would say like, sometimes it's nice to just do a small one. If you have like a bunch of burst of energy, I think there's, I believe that independence conscious one of the pieces. And that was actually one that um, I did pretty quickly over the span of a few days, um, and it was just kind of in this heat of the moment, this excitement about the fourth, and we were, things with COVID were looking up, it seemed like we were going to have like outdoor barbecues, and it was just kind of like this emotional rally, like, yeah, we're doing this. Mm -hmm. um, that was kind of like a nice moment to do a particularly, it's like a seven by five piece there, um, and, and because it was just a very small and like substantial spurt of energy right there. Mm -hmm. Here's our independence conch right here. Excellent. Thank you so much, Anna. It was a really, really great to uh, get to know your process and your inspiration. And um, I look forward to seeing your fluffy Australian shepherd yeah. one day. <laughs> um, and I hope that you get a chance to go to Kamika Coffee or, uh, and get some coffee and a bagel or two. And um, yeah, any last questions? Last, so we're gonna open up the floor in a bit, but any specific questions for Anna? Um, one, two, three. <laughs> Thank you so much, Anna. It's been a pleasure. Thanks. Okay, like I said, you can see these works online in, from the comfort of your home. You can go to artspan.org slash vein gallery. Um, this collection of artwork holds all of our art and neighborhoods exhibitions. Oh, look at, there's the Australian Shepherd. Oh, <laughs> what a cutie. Um, you may see all the artwork that we have up in, um, in several venues around the city, uh, including Kamika Coffee with artists Anna and Tyler. 
So please head on down to Kamaika Coffee. It's in the Excelsior neighborhood. It is a great place to stop. They have a back patio if you need to get some sun or fresh air. And they are open really early for those commuters. Um, and they stay pretty late until 6 p.m. Um, if you are a night owl, you need your coffee at 5 o'clock. That's just the place to go. <laughs> And uh, this is our website for any additional information about events or um, open studios, please visit artspan.org. I am now going to stop sharing my screen so we can enjoy everyone's presence. Um, please use the view box on your top right corner and press yeah. gallery to see everyone and uh, say hi. You could turn on your screen and say hi to the artists, uh, give some kudos, give a little uh, ask some questions to the artists. If you didn't feel brave enough to put it in the chat, you may do so now. <laughs> we do want to thank everyone for joining us tonight. Um, I have, a, I like to have a little questions just on my, on the back end. Um, and I know that um, Anna talked about, you know, happy mistakes, um, but for Tyler, do you sometimes make a mistake and you just you kind of roll with it? Uh, no, I never make mistakes, Nick. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> no, of course. Yeah, all the time. Um, yeah, I think uh, I, very often there will be, and, and this may sound silly, but there will be like a circle that I'll be like, oof, why did I do that? Why? That one circle. Um, and and yeah, it, it, you go with the flow and you absorb it and it, and it becomes part of this, this greater thing. And um, for me, that's, it, it goes back to that like in process work where even mistakes where I'll maybe totally stop a, a piece um, for you know, maybe weeks or, or months until I'm going back through my, my books and trying to look at, get something out and I see it and I'm thinking, oh, you know what? Like maybe there's something here. and build on it a little bit and, and integrate it and yeah you can you can kind of create um yeah create happy accidents i don't know just mm -hmm. just watch that bob ross documentary so yeah happy accidents i have, I have yet to watch that so i look forward don't no spoilers <laughs> please yeah i, I right. to watch it i hear there's some surprises too <laughs> um tanya there are <laughs> tanya hi welcome you're on this you're, you're on the air tanya <laughs> Hi, thanks for having me. <laughs> of course. Um, I just had a question for Anna. I wanted to know, um, when was it that you committed yourself fully to making art? Or I guess like you were saying that you had, a, like you always had a want for it and you never gave time to do it. And then you just had this moment where you really like had to stop and say like, I really need to start creating. Like how long ago was that? Um, a little over a year ago. I mean, I would say that I always kind of did this stuff on the side. I just didn't have, um, there's a difference in being able to work on it um, on occasion and really making it a practice in your life. Um, and so I would say it was a little bit over a year ago, around the same time as like the pandemic is when I kind of decided I'm sw I switched into a much a, a great company to work for otherwise. And I was like, now I'm really going to spend my time on artistic ventures. And it was a big process. I think like in the beginning, I wasn't necessarily, I was like, it's, I'm just doing it for fun and I'm going to explore. And then I finally was able to say like, okay, this is the thing and I'm pursuing it and pursuing it more, um, more ferociously, I guess. Um, and, and it was a natural process. It was just, as soon as I had the time, that's what I spent my time doing. <laughs> That's great. Really um, happy to hear that that happened to you. I have a completely different experience. So that was why I was curious. I've been making art my whole life and I couldn't possibly fathom of not had been making it as a teenager and all that. So I just like get so curious to talk to people who partway through life, they're, you know, they're just like, that's it. I'm done. I'm making art. <laughs> so I really congratulate you because uh, I really love your work and it's nice to, to meet another. I'm, you can't see me. I'm also a woman as well. So I was relating to what you were talking about with being in a man's world and, and definitely being a, an outcast in, in some ways, just because of that. So nice meeting you. Nice meeting you. And thank you so much for sharing that. Um, and our good friend Jason 
put a note in the chat saying that Tanya was a um, a former exhibiting artist at Kumaika. Oh, so cool. you both, you three have uh, something in common. Um, so yeah. Actually, not to correct you, but I oh. wasn't an exhibiting artist. I was the first artist to curate the space. Um, Artspan asked me to step in uh, about two years ago. I can't remember, maybe a little bit more than two years ago. And um, I curated the space for about six months and it was a lot of fun. They hadn't, we both mutually had no experience working together and it was really wonderful to be in the neighborhood and get to know the owners of Kamaika and all the employees. And, and, you know, it was really a lot of fun. So here I am seeing the evolution of that, <laughs> you mm -hmm. know, virtually, which we definitely were not doing at the beginning. So this is really cool. Thank you, Tanya, for chiming in. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks for having me again. Of course. Um, if anyone else feels brave enough to go off mute and ask the artist some questions, please do, please do so now. We would love to get some feedback or have continue the conversation or just say hi. hi. <laughs> Tyler, is that your family we're seeing? Um, where? Oh, what? I see them. Oh, do you see the icon? Oh, yeah. Uh, it says it says Annie Atura Bushnell. Oh, <laughs> children and two children. It looks like w one of them. One of okay. them is mine. The okay. other one is uh, not. But but yes, indeed it is. All right. I didn't even know. <laughs> didn't even know yeah. it was on video. On gallery, if you go on gallery view. <laughs> yeah. Um, Anna, I just want to note that your background right now is the sunset, and uh, it's a beautiful pink lavender, and I could view from my apartment as well, and it's qu quite spectacular. Yeah. Um, maybe that pink can be an inspirational color for your next piece. Yeah, definitely. I, I actually really, the trip at Mount Rainier piece with the pink, I, I kind of had me thinking I have to use more pink. So yeah. it's good you said that. <laughs> sure. Hey, pink is power, baby. Yeah. <laughs> a nice, a nice uh, intense magenta will really kind of, I don't know, make something bold and exciting. And I know you can really work with color well. So um, I'll keep, a, keep an eye out for that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, well, I'm going to wrap up this reception. I want to thank everyone for joining us tonight. Um, please grab your beverage if you have one and give the artists a good old cheers. Kudos to you. We want Thank you for um, being an Arts Band artist and celebrating and uh, with us uh, for of you all. And congratulations on your show, Akamika. Cheers. Cheers. Thank cheers. You. Cheers. Thank you. Cheers.